Hi, good evening. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan. Thank you for joining me again. As I continue this journey with regards to GERD. So I'm a physician. I've been um, focused on autoimmunity around COVID-19. And as part of that uh, research and that education for myself and others, I've been interviewing people for quite a while. One of the people I interviewed in March 2021 was Gert van den Bosch, who is an expert in vaccine development. And we had a very important discussion about the risks of mass vaccination in the pandemic. I've interviewed Gert on multiple occasions, and the most recent interview was Gert's warning on a new COVID variant, the JN1, and he is very, very concerned as to the implications. And so yesterday I took a bit of a deeper dive looking at Gert's predictions with regards to this JN1, why it is that uh, it was probably occurring, what was the relevance from an immunological perspective. It has gotten a lot of attention, but a lot of people are stepping away feeling, well, what does it mean? What can we do? Before I go any further, I'll just mention that if you are interested, uh, we have done here on the Substack, uh, Understanding Gert's Predictions, a conversation with Dr. Rob Renenbaum, who has been following Gert's work for some time. And we had about a 66-minute long discussion picking a park and trying to understand some of the perspectives. It's not a perfect discussion because we were both uh, bouncing ideas off each other. And in time, I will be speaking with Gert again, hopefully with Rob, to tease out some more of exactly what he is seeing. So for those who don't quite understand and think that this is alarmist, I'll give you some historical, biblical context. So the story that I'd mention is that of Jonah. That is a biblical story, and you've heard the story of Jonah who was asked to go and speak to the people of Nineveh. He didn't want to do it. He tried to run away. He then got swallowed by a whale, and then he was spat out on the shores uh, of Nineveh to go and speak to them. And he didn't want to do it because at the time he had some issues with the oppressors, and he still had to go and share his prophecy at the time about the fact that Nineveh was going to be destroyed. Now, what's interesting is that after he told them that Nineveh was going to be destroyed, the people listened, changed their minds, and they were saved. So God saved them at the time. But guess what? Jonah was extremely upset because he looked like an idiot. He had gone and said that this was going to happen, and then it didn't happen. That was where he was taught an important lesson about compassion, that in the context of what he had to say, would he prefer for the people to die than it was for him to say what needed to occur? That's where I put the category of Gert. He had to say what he has to say. His job is to look at it and to predict, goodness, I think this volcano is going to blow. I have to say something. Our job is to listen and to try and see if we can mitigate or stop that from happening. His analysis is likely to be correct, but the outcomes don't have to occur. That's where the clinical side comes in. And so my view is that if GERT is correct, we need to find solutions. So I'll take you back to where this is in the current time so that you understand what I mean. So again, we're talking about, um, this is an example of, this is really what is happening in real time in Iceland. And uh, so this is from December 19th, 2023. This is the volcano that has erupted. And it was erupting in and close in Iceland to a specific town where the people in that town were at risk. And so in that circumstance, they evacuated the town because they didn't know which way the lava would flow. And this is what then happened. And you can see here, and uh, this is the region of Iceland. This is where the volcano is. And this is the town here, Grindavik, which was right in line potentially for when the volcano um, did explode, they could have had lava 
people going through the town. Luckily, it seemed that there was a fissure instead, and the lava then went somewhere else. There is still a risk to this town, but the disaster did not happen. That's how we have to look at things. The disaster could happen. We don't know the percentages. Gert feels very strongly that it's almost inevitable. And there are many aspects of what he has said that I think he's right on. Actually, from an autoimmune perspective, I think that the disaster is inevitable. It's just how long does it take? Because autoimmunity can take five to 10 years to present. So from my perspective, I agree that it is going to be a huge disaster, no matter which way we go. But I think Gert is much more concerned about a virulent variant occurring within a short period of time. Now, one of the things that Gert highlighted was that the immune system was shifting away from antibodies to using C cytotoxic lymphocytes. And just so that we have a reminder of our army um, in terms of the body, this is what it looks like in terms of the bone marrow producing all of these uh, cells that go on to become activated immune cells. This is a stem cell which breaks into two groups, lymphoid and myeloid. And the myeloid produces the basic, the pawns, we could call it in chess. These are the most abundant neutrophils. They have short lives. Monocytes can live quite long if they become macrophages or dendritic cells. And these are an important part of that system. You also have eosinophils and basophils and so on. This is blood cells and these are platelets. So that's one side of the immune system. On the other side is the lymphoid um, progenitor cells, which then make T cells, B cells, and, and natural killer cells. The critical one that he's talking about here, so just so you understand, the B cell produces the plasma cell that makes antibodies. The T cell is what he is saying has now become very, very active in the context of the evolution of these variants. In truth, the T cells are always active, but it seems as though the immune system is shifting to downregulate the antibodies because they're no longer working against the JN1. And so therefore, this is more like this is all that the immune system has left to fight the virus. And this was where I made the analogy that uh, in effect, the ground troops are going in. You can no longer use the RAF. You've run out of artillery. And all you've left is the Marines on the ground to try and deal with the enemy. That's quite serious. And there's a reason why I consider that so serious, because in the context of SARS-CoV-2, you have a very strange situation occurring where the virus also infects T cells. So the last rung of immunity is also a target by the virus. It's what we call ACE-independent infection of the T lymphocytes. And what they're finding here is when they look carefully, the T cells can get inside these, um, they, I mean, the virus can get inside these T cells and it causes in vitro infection of T cells, which leads to cell death. I think it's because of the damage to the mitochondria. And so this infection in T cells is likely to be the cause of significant lymphopenia, where we have low levels of lymphocyte in COVID-19 patients. That's actually very, very serious because as we pointed out, if the last rung is these T cells, because the antibodies are no longer able to control JN1, and you have disseminated infection that is damaging these T cells, in effect, you're going to have a situation of immune deficiency where you are lost antibodies, you've lost T cells, you should hopefully still have functioning natural killer cells and other parts working, but it is significantly depleted. That's a real concern with regards to the longer term outcomes of the pandemic. So it leads me to the point. My job now is that I look at the risk and my question is, how can we mitigate it? What can we do? Because it, it's not just a defeatist perspective. It's how can we prepare 
for the solutions. Now, I was noticing in the comments yesterday, many people were saying, what's the point of telling us this if you don't tell us what to do? And that woke me up this morning, which is why I'm talking to you on Christmas Eve. And it made me remember that, yes, I have prepared that um, here, which is that how to prepare for the next wave of COVID-19. I anticipated this all the way from October, November. And so this is a course, and in it, I have a number of things that are important, looking at the different states of COVID, probably needs to be updated a bit, looking at upper airway strategies, over-the-counter supplements, prescription medication, treatment algorithms, innovative ideas, and that's available at the link below for those people who want solutions. So the point being, I don't want you to think that there is nothing that can be done. And to give you context as to what I was saying in terms of preparing is that when I looked at this here, and this is part of the presentation, I've just got it here in a slideshow format, the recurring COVID infection is a critical aspect that needs to be addressed. You need effective mucosal immunity. If you do, you have more protection. If you don't, the next question is about interferon autoantibodies and then about vaccination status, because that seems to damage the immune response at the mucosa level, which would increase the risk of recurring infection. My view was that we had here strategies, seven strategies that I think would boost defenses. And this is why I said, you want to combine all of these seven strategies or you don't want to be overlapping. So meaning that if you're using something that slows endosomal traffic, there's no point using two things that do that. You would want something that inhibits viral in entry, something that does this, something that inhibits the proteases, something that can block the, uh, inter that can interfere with the interferon blockage. You'd want something that could inhibit the release of the virus, and you'd want something that could immune, um, augment immunity. So these are all parts of uh, a strategy that are very important for us to understand. And this is why I said, in terms of preparing solutions, it's really critical that we think objectively about what can be done. To give you an example as to why this is so important is that when we look at uh, this slide here was just talking about the entry and exit in 48 hours and the fact that the virus causes these little microvilli to become like huge trees so that it can spread the virus. So an important aspect is inhibiting uh, these um, enzymes, actually PAC1, and one of the things that blocks this process is um, that, sadly, I can't say it because it can lead to censorship, but it's a, a medication that rhymes with pectin and has been used for many years, got a Nobel Prize, and that actually impacts on the ability of the virus to be able to spread. But there are other things that work. So if you imagine you can't get access to that, Simply, there are other things that can work. There are 10 other substances that have an impact on PAC-1, and any one of them or a combination of them can help. The point being is that there are solutions that we can do. There are things that we can prepare for. You don't want to wait until the lava is coming out of the volcano to try and start figuring out what needs to be done. My belief is that the better your education, the better that you understand about how things work, the more prepared you will be. It's likely that there will still be significant damage at a population level. But if you can protect yourself and your loved ones, that's a big step. And most importantly, I'll finish with this point. There's one thing that, as I mentioned before about PAC-1, and I, I really want um, people to, to think about this here. Um, the PAC-1 point is, um, I'll show you this slide again. So this, again, as I said, is how the virus is able to spread so quickly. It goes in on these cilia, these sweep the mucus along. So this is all mucus here in white sweeps it along. So the virus binds here, slides down, gets inside the cell, replicates, and it doesn't get out on this, on the cilia. What it does, it grows these microvilli 
so that they become tree-like and above the mucus, and then the virus can spread in 48 hours. So as I said, anything that inhibits this process is going to make a huge difference. So if you can't get access to rhymes with pectin, what you can then do is that one of the simplest ways of, of addressing that is to use vitamin D. And vitamin D, I'll, I'll probably have to do a whole presentation on vitamin D. It is so very, very important. And it's one of those things that I, I just can't think any logical reason that someone would not encourage somebody if they are vitamin D deficient to make sure, especially in wintertime, that you have got adequate amounts of vitamin D. Forget whether or not somebody's arguing if it works or if it doesn't work, your body needs it. And it does multiple things um, in terms of uh, helping the immune system to work better. You have nothing to lose by making sure that your immune system is well covered. Uh, one final thought is that um, one of the other things that I'm going to be addressing very soon is about the sinuses and the fact that nitric oxide is going to have an impact on how viruses work any virus. And if the levels are correct in these uh, sinuses, this alone can stop or significantly Im um, impede the spread of the virus. So as I said, there are many things that can be done. I have listened to Gert. As I said, I don't I always agree with everything he says, but I know from a research point of view, his research is likely to be sound. Will it necessarily present the way that he describes? Maybe not. But I do think that the implications of it are so serious that we do have to consider preparing all solutions and making sure that we are ready for every eventuality. At the end of the day, we are on the brink of Christmas, and my job is still to try and find answers, and most importantly, to wish you a good period with your family. Think and prepare for all eventualities in this pandemic. Have a Merry Christmas. Thank you.